Welcome back inside the den. Hey, an amazing episode coming up today. Week zero just got done, wrapped up in the books. Nevada takes the loss to SMU, 29 to 24. Uh, really close game. I'm joined, as always, by, by Chris Murray. Chris, a lot closer than we expected. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot closer than you expected, right? What was your score? Oh, 49-21. So, yes, I had... Was it 49? I thought it was higher. It might have been like 52. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly closer than I expected as well. I had it 18-point uh, margin. It was a five-point margin. And honestly, I think Nevada's going to look back at this game and say that they feel like they should have won it. I mean, really, the first 50 minutes, Nevada played really good football. I mean, they were able to control the clock. They were able to limit the big plays. They were able to get some turnovers, some extra possessions. I think SMU was doing a lot to uh, self-inflict itself with a lot of mistakes. But um, you got to take advantage of those. And Nevada was doing that until, uh, you know, about 10 minutes to go. They're up by 11, and they weren't able to hold on. So, you know, it was an encouraging game for Nevada, but it was also a missed opportunity. Um, you know, it's kind of always hard to draw too much insight into one game. We don't know how good SMU is. We think they're going to be pretty good. We don't know how good Nevada is. Um, you know, a lot of things went in Nevada's favor in this game with SMU making some mistakes, but also give credit uh, to Nevada for creating some of those issues. So I think it was a real positive first step under Jeff Choate. Um, but again, you know, if you are up by 11 with less than 10 minutes to go against a power four opponent at home, you want to win that game. Um, that would have been a huge signal to Wolfpack fans, to Phil Mackey Stadium, to really support this team to do that as a 27 and a half point underdog. So um, I think it was a good result, but it wasn't a great result Nevada could have had, especially late in that game. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, definitely the first three quarters were shocking, uh, just just in terms of just the, the tide shifting. Uh, obviously, SMU, you know, the talent won out, uh, but I remember being on the sideline just as SMU got the ball, uh, you know, first got the ball after and Nevada three and out, and I was like, oh, I told a guy, I was like, this should be quick. Early then, in the game? Yeah, their first possession, I was yeah. like, this should be quick. And then, you know, the you know it, they go deep, and, and Charles Brown gets that interception. Chad I'm Brown. Like, uh, yeah, Chad, sorry, Chad <laughs> Brown, apologies. Uh, Chad Brown got the interception, and, uh, yeah, you you know, you're just like, oh, okay, this team has some fight. And that, that uh, secondary really was flying around. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of, kind of uh, surprising. Um, well, not too surprising considering the talent that they do have back there. Um, but, you know, a great deal of fight that they they, sh they showed. And, you know, if you – and we've talked about this in the past, Chris. Like, if you can just show some fight and, and you know, like scrap like that, especially in the Mountain West, you can you can get some wins. Um, you know, we talked about, like, how Air Force, like, that's kind of like how they've made their way in the conference these years without, you know, the luxury of NIL or the luxury of really got getting a lot of, like, transfer players. So – you know, I think the one thing we learned from from that first game is that, you know, Jeff Choate's guys, they're going to fight. Um, and, you know, obviously he'd probably like them to clean up some aspects of, of the game and, you know, less mental errors and all that because there were some snafus throughout the game that did cost them. Most notably, in my opinion, it was the Aston Hayes little snafu at the, the one-yard line uh, that cost him, you know, an eventual safety. Now you can argue with the, the semantics of it. Did they, the refs actually get it right or not? Um, still just have, having the situational awareness to avoid that and potentially, you know, going from a one-point game with SMU ball uh, at seven minutes left to potentially driving downfield up three and, you know, possibly getting an upset. Yeah. Um, so those are just things you're going to look out for for the rest of the season. But, uh, yeah, I think a good first step. But, yeah, just walk us through that last quarter. What went wrong? Obviously, I mentioned the the Hayes thing, but it just felt like everything shifted in that, that final. I think SMU just started playing to its potential. I mean, if we're being yeah. honest about it, they stopped getting dumb uh, penalties. Um, you know, they really cleaned up what they did in terms of pass protection. And then they were able to find a matchup that was really good for them, RJ Maryland against Aiden Sueli. And once they started going to their could be an All-American tight end, that's when the game really turned. I mean, you look at Maryland, zero catches in the first half, more than 150 yards in the second half. So, um, you know, I think they were probably trying to get to that matchup earlier in the game. Obviously, in the first half, they switched quarterbacks. And I don't think that's always the best thing to get into a rhythm. And then they got down and they kept Preston Stone in the game. He was the better throwing of the two quarterbacks. And I knew that they had to catch up. So, um, you know, I think that was a big thing. And I think Nevada's push on the offensive line wasn't quite as strong. Um, they were able to run the ball pretty decently with the running backs early in the game. 
And then in the second half, they weren't able to do that. They didn't have any verticality with the pass game at all. They only had one traditional pass that went for more than 15 yards. They had a trick play that went for 18 yards. And on that one, it was a third and one. And mm -hmm. there was a defensive bust. So Nevada was not able to get the ball down the field against SMU. SMU's defensive line really started to heat things up in that fourth quarter. And this isn't a, a group of guys that have been in that situation very often. So I think that's a learning lesson, too. Um, you know, 20 losses the last two seasons, 16 by double digits. So it's not like they played a lot of close games where they had to execute late. Obviously, that Ashton Hayes play, that was a big, uh, you know, mistake, and it put Nevada in a really difficult position. But the Wolfpack does give up the safety, which isn't honestly the worst thing in the world, rather than kicking out of your, you know, punting out of your own end zone. Sometimes that, that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're still up. And then they went, they got a defensive stop on a short field, got the ball back. And then they go three and out, and they gave the mm -hmm. ball right back to SMU, and then they hit Maryland for that game-winning touchdown. At that point, you got about 85 seconds to go to go the length of the field for a touchdown, and that wasn't how Nevada was playing that game. They were yeah. trying to possess the clock. They were trying to get three, four yards per carry. They weren't throwing the ball down the field, so that wasn't a good situation for them. So, um, you know, I think after the safety, getting that stop was big, and then they get into, you know, like the six-minute offense where you want to melt the clock, and they went three and out. I just think that there wasn't enough going on with the pass game to really threaten SMU. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at Nevada's offense, the, the point total might look pretty good, 24 points. But they only had three drives out of 12 that went more than 20 yards. So I still think this offense, you know, has a lot to prove if Nevada's going to be able to go and, you know, make it to a bowl game and be competitive in the Mountain West. But, um, yeah, the defense, I thought, played really, really well. And, you know, for 50 minutes, it was a really good showing. And now we'll see if they can put together a fuller effort against Troy this weekend. Yeah, it should be an interesting matchup coming up. Uh, just to put a bow on the SMU game, yeah, just you know, a good effort all around. Uh, fell just short. Uh, obviously, yeah, when you're going against a team of that talent, it, you, you'd imagine that a talent will, will eventually rise. But a thing I wanted to point out is that you know Nevada had the luxury of you know the unknown. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the SMU coaching staff, you know, they could possibly you know like. Uh, try to dig up some fall camp things or, you know, past things that Choate and Kane and the entire staff have done in the past. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to, to know what they're going to do ahead of a, a week zero matchup. Um, and in turn, this week, Nevada's kind of on the opposite end, right? Because it's uh, an entirely new Troy team, uh, new coaching staff, a bunch of new transfers. They have to dig through, you know, old old film on all these players and 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 coach the, the entire coaching staff to possibly predict what they're going to do come Saturday. Um, it should be an interesting matchup. Uh, do you put much stock in like that advantage or, or disadvantage? Well, I think it's going to be hard for Nevada to prepare for the game. I mean, yeah. Troy has the third least returning scholarship players in the FBS. They have a new coaching staff. Uh, and that head coach has not been a head coach before. He was an interim head coach at Purdue in 2016. You're not going to pull much from that. Um, they have gone back to kind of the West Virginia roots for this um, game because the head coach, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, at some point in their career, they coached at West Virginia. The guy who kind of got Troy on the map, Neil Brown, um, he is now West Virginia's head coach. So I think they've got some stuff to look at, but I think this is going to be a big challenge game for the Nevada coaching staff to be able to make in-game adjustments, be able to make halftime adjustments because um, the personnel hasn't put a lot of film out there. Obviously, the coaching staff hasn't put a lot of film out there. So I think it's going to be very difficult to know exactly what the Trojans are going to do at opening kickoff, um, which will put some pressure on Nevada to be able to identify that and make those adjustments. And you did see that uh, in the SMU-Nevada game. SMU kind of was on the back foot from the beginning because they weren't you know quite ready for Nevada's physicality and maybe what they were doing schematically Brendan Lewis obviously was able to run the ball really really successfully and they were able to scheme up some of that stuff so um, yeah that's a disadvantage for Nevada in this game but I think overall I think you know this is a very winnable game for the Wolfpack I mean if it had been Troy of the last two seasons it would have been tough Troy won 23 games the last two seasons Nevada won four but almost all those players your six-year starting quarterback, your top running back, your top two wide receivers, your top two pass rushers, a lot of your secondary, those guys are gone. Um, so there are actually only three players on this Troy roster that have started more than 10 college football games outside of kicker and punter who also come back. So um, it's a really big opportunity for Nevada to go out and get a win against a Troy team that will be playing its first game. Mm -hmm. So they have not worked out the kinks, and they have not really played together, that group. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, I think it's a, an advantage for Nevada that they've got that first game together and they should be a little bit more advanced 
uh, uh, for the opening kickoff as a result. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Nevada football's SID Aaron Juarez, and he was saying, hey, like, you know, that's obviously a disadvantage, but there is also an advantage to having that week zero matchup, um, going full speed, getting those reps. Sure, you put your stuff out on film, but the players have had a full 60 minutes of full reps, full mm -hmm. game reps that can uh, possibly translate to you know a better play in the, coming up against Troy because uh, you're really knocking off rust, right? I mean that's a that's a uh, it's one thing to go you know all out at fall camp, and most most schools do not you know and you're not really tackling to the ground, right? You're not you're not like you know trying to like hurt each other out there, right? Um, so just having that extra 60 minutes uh, versus a team that's kind of wet behind the ears, so to speak. Uh, could play in an early advantage for for Nevada. Obviously, things you know things are are different. Obviously, just going on the road, travel week. You're playing in Alabama, you know, in a hostile environment. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that you know, different moving elements that you know the Nevada team has to end up being fluid because you know you never know. And in Jeff Choate's Monday presser, he, he kind of mentioned that he was saying, you know, just. I let the team know that things are going to go wrong, you know, like maybe our flight's going to have delayed or like, you know, our hotel is going to, you know, have this out or that. So just got to be, got to be fluid and, you know, be like, hey, if we have to go practice in the parking lot, we're going to have to go practice in the parking lot. So a cool mentality there. Um, but I do see an advantage go, going towards Nevada's way, just having had those snaps. Now, on the other hand, obviously, Troy has the film, you can see what the, the Lubbock offense and the k own defense uh, what their schematics are, um, but you know, just give me your read on that. You know, like, you know, obviously we'll go to we'll talk about predictions later later in the episode, but uh, just kind of give me your read of like who has the advantage here. Really. Well, I mean, Troy's a nine point favorite, so the yeah. sports books that I think that Nevada has, uh, you know, the advantage. I think if you look at all the intangibles in the game, it goes to Troy. You're at home. Yeah. You're not traveling half. You know, this is a very long trip for Nevada. Um, you don't got to deal with the humidity. Uh, that's something that Nevada will have to deal with. It's going to be 90 degrees. It's going to be hot. The Wolfpack's not the deepest team. So it sounds like they are going to try and rotate in some players earlier in the game to keep them fresh later in the game. Um, I wouldn't say Troy's a super deep team either. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, you look at Troy having the home field advantage, having kind of the unknown of what they're doing offensively and defensively. And I'd probably rather have that than have the game under your belt. Certainly that helps mm. um, that you've, you know, worked out some kinks, but also where were Nevada be emotionally? You know, they were so invested in that SMU game, huge underdogs playing at home, ready to get after it. Uh, now you go on the road a week later, can you resummon, I guess, that emotional spirit for this game? Um, whereas Troy's obviously going to be pumped up. It's their first game. It's their home opener. They're going to have their fans there. So from an intangible, st uh, uh, intangible standpoint, I probably would take Troy's situation, but um, you know, both have advantages and disadvantages coming into this game from that perspective. Now, you had a position preview that came out. Uh, you actually gave Nevada some some checks. Uh, obviously, last week it was all tilted towards SMU. Just kind of kind of run us through where S uh, where Nevada does have you know a positional advantage. Versus I think it's Georgia's. most of them, just because Troy's got so many uncertainties on the roster. So they've got a brand new quarterback. He's not, uh, I guess, brand brand new. His name is Goose Crowder. A um, couple years at West Virginia, he was a backup at Troy last year, but he's never actually started an FBS game. Um, he has played mop-up duty, and the numbers are actually pretty good. So I'd say from that perspective, Brendan Lewis is a little bit more known quantity. I'd like to see him push the ball down the field successfully a little bit more, but I'd give the check to Nevada based on that experience. You got a guy going into his third year as a starter versus a guy starting his first game. Um, you look at running back. Uh, Troy's got one good running back back. Um, but I don't think it's got quite the stable that Nevada has, so I'd give the check mark to Nevada. You look at wide receiver. I did give it to Troy, but it actually is pretty even. Um, their best wide receiver at Troy transferred to Texas A&M. Their second best wide receiver, 10 touchdowns last year. Unfortunately, um, diagnosed with cancer, so mm. he's going to be sitting out this season. Um, they do have one starter back at the wide receiver position, and their tight end's a pretty solid player as well. From Nevada's perspective, they've really got like a top two. And if one of those two goes down with an injury, they don't have quite as much depth behind them. So I had to give Troy the tech check mark there. Yeah. Also gave it to Troy for the offensive line. I think you look at this Trojan offensive line, that's really the only experience they have coming back. They're starting uh, right guard and they're starting center, both back. Both of those guys preseason all Sun Belt picks. Um, I think the tackles are pretty unknown, but on offense, um, you know, that's pretty even, uh, mm -hmm. you know, two check marks to two check marks there. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there is, you know, still questions about this Nevada offense. I think they did really well in the red zone last week, three touchdowns and four appearances plus a field goal. And that helped 
pushed those numbers up in terms of the point total. Um, but Troy's kind of known as being a great defensive team, and I think this is going to be a big offensive challenge for the Wolfpack. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned uh, it's kind of like uh, offensive depth there. Now, obviously, Nevada's pretty set with their outside receivers in, in both Jaden Smith and Cortez Braham, who both made some plays during uh, you know their loss to SMU. Um, but just kind of walk us through that depth below those two. Just in case, you know, anytime throughout the season that like one of those guys happens to go down. Well, the slot receiver Marcus Bellin, he's the trucky kid. I actually yeah. thought he, you know, he's really good punt returner. Fun player. Yeah, I think yeah. if you can get the ball to him in space, he can do some stuff. He can get some mm -hmm. yards after carry. So he's kind of your third starter right now. Um, beyond that, I, on the outside, I would say Marshawn Brown, the retro freshman uh, wide receiver from Minogue. He played a little bit last year. He's kind of your next big option. And then after that, it does fall off quite a bit in terms mm -hmm. of guys who are ready to go out there and play right now. You got a guy named Jarek Robinson. He's a transfer from Colorado State who was on Nevada's roster. You got Nate and Bob Burleson the second. Um, he's a second year player. Still a little bit thin, needs to get a little bit more physical, but he's a, somebody you can see playing time if you see injuries at the wide receiver position. You got Charles Brown. Um, he's been kind of banged up, kind of in and out of the lineup throughout the fall, but he's a guy who Nevada's counting on to, to give some good valuable reps. So um, really it's Marshawn Brown and then a couple of other guys, but uh, Nevada needs those top two guys to be really good and, and Jace Henry as well, the tight end. So, um, you know, he scored a touchdown in the first game. Maybe you see them getting him uh, the ball a little bit more. I think they just didn't want to like screw anything up with the pass game against SMU because mm. that pass rush is so good. Yeah. So a lot of it was safe throws. I think Quick as the passes. season goes on, you're going to have to get the ball down the field a little bit more to yeah. be successful. And we'll see if that does happen, if that's in the game plan for Troy. Because you look at the Troy defense, I think the linebackers are really good. Um, I think the defensive line is kind of a question mark. They lost two really, really good defensive linemen. One graduated, one was drafted by the Buffalo Bills. They combined for like 26 um, sacks, and I think it was like 38 tackles for loss last year. Uh, the safeties are, are pretty solid. But the cornerbacks are a little bit inexperienced as well. So you might be able to see with the younger defensive line and younger cornerbacks. Mm. I think Nevada is always going to be run first this season. But I think you might see them take some shots against, uh, you know, some of those guys if they can get the pass protection they're looking for and then maybe take advantage of those younger cornerbacks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just kind of a segue here, but uh, Brendan Lewis was the leading rusher against SMU, uh, obviously had some moments as a passer, matched his season total last year in touchdown passes in one game. Um, so, I mean, like Coach Choate said, he, he really wasn't making mistakes, crucial mistakes, throughout the game. Uh, he seems firmly entrenched at that QB1 position. Obviously, before the season and throughout fall camp, much was made about the uh, quarterback you know, just uh, not not controversy, but battle, um, so to speak. Uh, reportedly, uh, Chuba Purdy was cleared to throw. Um, do you see Chuba as a possible, you know, man under center down the line this season? Or it, it just depends on how Brendan Lewis plays. Yeah, I mean, Brendan Lewis is the starter. He earned that opportunity. I think if he plays like he did in the first game, that's probably good enough to keep him at that position. I think him running was Nevada's most successful offense in that game. Without his legs, Nevada wasn't moving the ball very well. Um, so I think, like we've said, that he's got to get the ball down the field. That's not something they really did when he was at Colorado. Last year, they took some deep shots, but if you look at like yards per attempt, it was in like the low fives. You want yards per, per uh, attempt in college to be around seven. Low fives, it's tough to move the ball consistently. Yeah. It, it's tough to have those explosive plays. Um, so I think Brendan Lewis firmly has the job, but that can change if you have two bad games. That could change if you start 0-3 or 0-4. Um, you know, Chubba Purdy's not someone who's really thrown the ball for almost all of Nevada's spring camp and fall camp because of various injuries. He's not somebody who's really gone through an entire season healthy this is fifth year of college, two at Florida State, two at Nebraska. He's had injuries in all those years. So, um, you know, I think he's a really nice option, an intriguing option. I think his legs are a big asset as well. I think he's a very good athlete. Um, whether he actually becomes the starter will be dictated on how Brendan Lewis plays. And then right now, A.J. Bianco is behind Brendan Lewis. And I think that's going to be the pecking order even when Chubba gets healthy until he gets into practice and can show what he can do. Now, the tough thing is you're not really given three quarterbacks like first team reps in practice. So the battle is kind of over at this point. And how does Chubba Purdy get back into that mix 
with limited practice reps and you as a staff are trying to get your number one quarterback as prepared as possible. So I wouldn't rule it out, certainly. Um, but there is an uphill battle to climb to see Chubba Purdy playing just because of, unfortunately, he did have to deal with that shoulder, which knocked him out for most of all in terms of the competitive throwing aspect of practice. Obviously, his legs were still good and he was still doing stuff. But running the offense and throwing the ball and all of that stuff, he was kind of not able to do. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I just the, the QB depth chart as it stands right now, Bianco was probably your two, your, your true two right now. Um, obviously, this, this, the, these things could change throughout the season. Um, but, yeah, I thought Lewis uh, showed some promise on this past Saturday against SMU. Uh, one thing I, I noticed, uh, like an uptick in, in, in performance compared to years past is, was uh, red zone efficiency. I think they got pretty creative down there. Uh, nice little flat uh, in for the, you know, to Jace Henry for that first touchdown. Uh, you know, that's a cool little wrinkle. And then obviously Savion Red pumping up the crowd and punching it in via the Wildcat. It was kind of funny. I was in the press box, and uh, before they broke for the, the huddle, they were on the sideline. It was a timeout. And I uh, look over to Big Country, our insert, and I'm like, I was like, all right, this next play is going to be a Wildcat play to uh, Savion Red touchdown. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and they come out <laughs> right away. Uh, and they did it. So I felt like Nos uh, you know, uh, Nostradamus for a second there. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah, that's that's the advantage of me going to fall camp and seeing. Yeah, it pays to go to practice. Yeah, it does pay to go to practice. They had a couple <laughs> of trick plays in there. They had a pass from Jaden Smith, a wide receiver, to Marcus Bellin. That one yeah. went for 18 yards. It was their second longest throw. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of that. I think Jeff Choate's not afraid of um, you know, doing stuff like that. They did go for a fourth down around midfield. That didn't work out. Um, Sean Dollars got gobbled up behind the line of scrimmage. But, um, yeah, I think this staff's going to try and be creative. They're going to try and do a couple tricks, trick plays a game, and they're going to see, um, you know, how aggressive they can be on fourth down as well. I think they're going to have to steal some possessions like that if they're going to beat some of the better teams on their schedule. So I think that's always fun when you can see those trick plays. Yeah. And um, Actually, in the, the wide receiver pass, uh, the CBS crew kind of actually criticized it because Nevada had control of the game. And they're like, why are you taking that risk? Well, uh, it kind of opened up, <laughs> you know, a, a deeper pass than what yeah. Nevada had seen for much of the game. So, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe uh, one trick play a, uh, a half or something like that for the, the rest of the season. But also it depends where you're at in the game and, you know, kind of how your offense is moving and whether yeah. you, you need to go to that. And, um, yeah, it'll be uh, – the offense is what I'm going to be looking for in this game because, right. you know, I think it's going to be a lower-scoring game. Um, while Troy is a very different team, they're known for running the ball and they're known for having a really good defense. So they kind of want to limit the number of possessions as well. That's Nevada's formula to winning right now. So um, I would guess, uh, you know, under might be a good bet in this game. Yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was fun watching the, the defense fly around out there, obviously the secondary. But shout, shout out to some of the guys up front. Uh, it was a chippy game, uh, but it was kind of cool seeing Henry Ikahifo kind of step up and defend his teammate like that. Uh, definitely kudos to that. Obviously, you don't, want, you don't want those type of mental mistakes to cost personal fouls on, on both teams. But, you know, like, I think if you want to set a tone for the year just to, to step up and <laughs> protect your guy like that, uh, definitely sets a different tone than, than seasons past. Um, before we wrap up, Chris, we obviously got to get through some predictions. We you talked about it being a low-scoring game. Uh, just kind of give me the crystal ball here. What's it going to look like uh, down in Montgomery, Alabama, around 7.30? Uh, Troy, Alabama. Is it Troy? Yeah. Who said Montgomery? Somebody told me That's Montgomery. where they're staying. They're staying in Montgomery. Yeah. So they're going to Troy. So we're taping okay. this on Thursday. The team's actually flying out on Thursday. Yeah. It's a day earlier than usual, but it's a two-time zone travel. So if it's two time zones, usually they'll go out Thursday for a Saturday game. They're right. not doing that for the Minnesota game, which is also – two time zones, but they're trying to save a little bit of money there because they also got to go to Hawaii. But, right. yes, the game's actually in Troy. Okay, so I I, I, miss, I I didn't mishear it. I just watched Jeff Choate's Monday presser, and he said Montgomery, and I'm like, I there don't you go. Montgomery. So, yeah, they're so, about – it's like a 45-minute yeah. drive from yeah. my understanding. I've yeah. not personally been to Alabama. Uh, Tori Daffin's a Nevada player who grew up uh, in Ozark, Alabama, about 35 miles from the stadium. So he's going to have a lot of family and friends there. Michael Coates, Jr., uh, grew up in Mississippi. He's going to have a lot of family and friends there. Uh, Tyson Williams, he's on staff. He's a former Nevada safety coach. He's a graduate assistant. He's from uh, Alabama as well, Dothan, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, so he'll probably have some family and friends there. Um, I'm actually a little surprised it's a nine-point line. It, it opened up way higher during the summer, which made sense because you just look like, oh, this team's won 23 games the last two years. This team's won four games. 
But like you got to look at the personnel and the personnel mm-hmm. for Troy is untested and they're unproven. And the head coach is untested and he's unproven. Mm-hmm. Um, 43 years old, was previously the offensive coordinator at Notre Dame. Um, obviously, he's a very good coach, but being a head coach is a little bit different. Got one opportunity in the interim role when he was at Purdue, only 35 years old. They went 0-6. Mm. That was actually the same year that Purdue beat Nevada. Uh, 2016 uh-huh. ended up being Brian Polian's last year. Um, but I actually think Nevada's going to win this game. Uh, I would say straight up. I, I mean, if you can get the nine points, might as well take them. Um, but I would go money line on this one. I think Nevada's going to win nice. 24 to 20. I do think I'm not fully bought in on this offense for the Wolfpack just yet. Um, but I thought that the offensive line played pretty well. Uh, so I think yeah. Nevada should be able to run the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they might be able to get the ball down the field a little bit more. And I, I was really impressed by Nevada's defense. I mean, outside of that one matchup that SMU schemed up, I think the Wolfpack defense from the front, which was questionable. I thought the defensive tackles, which are, you know, kind of a question mark, played pretty yeah. well. I thought the linebackers played phenomenally. Naki Matialona and Drew Watts, they both had um, eight and nine tackles, so 17 tackles together. Um, they had uh, three pass breakups, uh, a couple of tackles for loss. I thought the cornerbacks played exceptionally well, and I thought Keaton Crawford at safety was really, really good. So I think Nevada's defense is going to have a lot of success in this game. Um, I think it's going to be a close one, and I think Nevada's going to win. So 24-20 is my prediction. Wow. What is yours? That's that's pretty good. You know, it, with that result, Nevada moves to 1-1, but 2-0 against the spread. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a, you know, take that, Vegas. Uh, so for me, I, I agree with your sentiments there. Uh, just largely, I mean, it, there's a high variance here, you know. It, Troy could very well win by you know, a couple of possessions. Um, like Vegas has predicted, uh, you know, it, it could turn out that their transfers are pretty good, and you know, like they're they're clicking right away when they they hit the field. But there's also a reality in which, on the other end, it's like, you know, they they still need to get their their ish together, um, so to speak, just to, you know, just 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 with the entirely moving parts and like entirely new staff, it's it takes a while to get to build that continuity mm-hmm. and Choate has that experience of like you know the luxury of having coached at the you know at least the F- FCS level and having seasoned vets as as uh you know as, as a staff so I think that there there's a big coaching advantage here and I'm gonna I'm gonna lean with you um I'll go a little higher though and they're gonna do it by the skin of their teeth 28 27 Nevada uh so that's that's my prediction and yeah, one and one, two and zero against the spread. So that's a that's that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, uh, what do you make of that result? You think it's? Uh, I mean, probably homers, right? Yeah. Uh, Sounds like we're homers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm kind of known for not being a homer, so <laughs> I'm kind of known for being a Wolfpack hater. I just pick what I think is going to happen, and after going through the Troy roster, I think Nevada's got a really good shot of winning this one. Now it's not easy winning on the road as you're rebuilding the program. I think yeah. that's one of the last things that actually comes is being able to win road games um, when you inherit like a culture that wasn't really winning. Uh, so I, I think it's a difficult challenge against a team that's won back-to-back Sun Belt Conference championships, picked to finish second in the West Division of the Sun Belt this year. But uh, I just feel like looking at the two rosters and with Nevada having that one game under its belt, I'm, I'm going to go with Nevada in this one, and that's why I will place my pick. All right. I guess we'll see you on Saturday. Uh, stick with us all day. Our Shannon Kelly is going to be down there, and uh, I'll be running social media. So if you guys have any questions, obviously reach out to us. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be back next time on Inside the Den. Guys, remember to like, rate, subscribe, wherever you guys get this podcast. And we'll be back next time.